Uh, for the workshop, unless there's anyone else uh, that wants to pick up some minis here real quick uh, before we get going. Mammal products. Okay, all right. But then what about platypus eggs? They are technically mammals. Hmm. I don't know if that's ever a problem that anyone would have to run into. Uh, so in this time, something else that I'd like to talk about, you know, we, we designed the race last night. We're talking about its cult uh, the culture, the things that they do. Uh, but we haven't really, have we explored who these people are? Maybe what they can look like, the different forms they can take. How do they work? Mechanically, they have these kind of light cores, right? Kind of like a will-o'-wisp. And these kind of misty, somewhat incorporeal bodies. So what do they look like? Do we have... Do we have a concept where they are all humanoid? Oh yeah, artists out there, eat your hearts out. Are they humanoid and then their core is, you know, in a place that we consider important, like a brain, um, a, a brain or a heart? Are they, are they kind of like a ghost and their core is like a cycloptic eye, like a Dusclops Pokemon? Are they actually, are they descended? You know, I, I keep saying centaurs, um, but are they, are they descended? And so they're, they're kind of, they're kind of like that. I like the idea of the heart and brain being lit. And and so we, we already wrote it. They have this mechanic where they constantly shed light from whatever their core is. But we haven't talked about things like wh where their core could be located. And going back to Maslow's hierarchy... How do they reproduce? You know? what happens how do they eat we could we could give them something like what you see with the uh, the will o wisps where they have uh, an undead nature they don't require air drink or sleep it's possible i don't know if it would break them as a race uh there are other races that have something similar you know such as uh warforged and uh Hmm. Hey, Jarnix. Age of Tesla says, what if they're centaur-like, but they split left, left, right, instead of top, bottom? So they'd be kind of like a three-legged thing? That'd be interesting. Because <laughs> I'm thinking and snacking here. What's the form that they take? Or were the nomads humanoid? And remember, humanoids can be orcs. Humanoids can be gnolls. G-N-O-L-L. -L, hyena people. Uh, humanoids can be, you know, it's a head, two arms, two legs, and a torso. Uh, could these have been uh, tiefling pilgrims? And so when we look at these people, you know, they have horns. 
Uh, and, and then they have bodies. But they also have a tail. Or, because they have been affected by the region, they were affected by the, the radiation, the lingering effects, the magic of this fallen comet or meteor. What if they don't look like? Um, what if they no longer look that way? Or, we could simply say, uh, hey, Orc, welcome. Uh, for, the, for the sake of, uh, for creativity or for the players, we give a general... A, a general height, you know, general dimensions uh, that are within the confines of a medium creature. And you get to choose. So, do you want... Because uh, you know, it's not going to make your, your movement any greater or lesser. But were the pilgrims actually of mixed races? Or if they weren't, uh, in some way... Oh, hi. Woo. There she goes. Thank you, Bubonic. If you got the cat butt, spam it. It is. You know, you could describe your uh your whisper character however you'd like so you're between i don't know uh let's say uh seven and a half feet and you know between five and a half and seven and a half feet you know, you fall in the medium category. You're on a one-inch base if we make a miniature out of you. And you can have... You can ha be a humanoid. You can be maybe tiefling or animal. You know, whether those are horns or like cat ears. Uh, you could take another race that you enjoy and use its form, but the statistics of a whisper. In some way. And so, if we, if we want to take the form off of the table to represent the fact that these people exist in uh, in a, a different state. In fact, there might even be, it's not a mechanical ability, but you know, they, you, you might even have some limited form of looking differently, or it is easier for you to disguise yourself. But what we really have to talk about, hi. Come on. Come on. Bye. There we go. Huh. If I'm going down, I'm taking y'all with me. What happened? Hey, I'm back. Hi, everyone. So if their form can be mutable, something that's not mutable 
is their core. Right? Their, their, their whisper core. And so we could give a different set of statistics for something like this. We are culminating everything we've worked on this week, Orc, into, well, into a culmination of everything we've worked on. Uh, currently, we're talking about a new race we created on the stream that exists in the environment, in the campaign, like the sandbox environment. Uh, we were plotting out the things that happened throughout the seasons. We've talked about it, the place's culture, uh, philosophy, and religion, and uh, just a lot of other things. What if their what if their core reflects the image of the bearer but differently? Can you give an example, Jarnix? And if the core is really what we're looking at, and you know what? We can if this seems like a trope or hackneyed, that's fine. This is D&D. You can be as hackneyed as you want. Um so what if this is is the important part of a person and and so here I'll, I'll use a humanoid shape if this is the expression you know so there's eyes right there's a mouth you know hands and fingers and such Is this something that we seek to have them show because their light and their life are intrinsically tied? Is this something culturally that is uh, something to show off? And so any anyone who wears clothing or armor... Uh, must show off the location of their core. And the core, uh, for some people, it could even be that the core isn't in their chest. It could be in their spatula hand. And so, in order to really... Like, they have a body... Their body can interact with the world and lift stuff, but their essence, as they were as they were born, is contained in their hand, and so their hand must be exposed to really be able to interact with other people. And in that case, you know, is it, uh, you know, so we'd have a play, uh, we'd have something where we have we have someone who is humanoid in shape. Their core is more in their belly. And so we have a group of uh, adventurers, right? And they come across uh, one of these whispers and uh, everything's kind of hanging out, right? And they're like, oh, gasp. What, what savages are these people who just, you know, walk around like this? This here? This doesn't really matter. This is just the form of... That's supporting the core, the the whisper, the the willow wisp style inspiration, uh, the soul, if you want to call it as such, or what they might call it is the star, right? If they're the children of this star that has fallen, if the star has made them this way, that's what they might call this. They are all these star children. Knees and toes, knees and toes. Hey, GM Vault, welcome. Good to see you again. Uh, that no one knows their true form as what they that no one knows their true form as when they look at them they are just a reflection they're a reflection 
So if it, Jarnix, you're saying if I, as a human being, approach one of these things, they will look like me because they don't have a form, but they'll look like whoever's looking at them. Ah, so when you look at them, they take the shape of what's looking at them? That could be really cool. And it won't really give them any sort of inherent bonus on disguises, because they still have this misty kind of, you know, it's it's quite, it's like semi-corporeal. They interact with the physical world. They don't take damage reduction. It's just like a very, um, it, it, it's a solid fog. Okay, yeah, Jarnix, I, I, that, that could be a really cool descriptor of them, actually. So, yeah, that's true. They could take on the form, the bodily form of, of someone else who's looking at them. And so, in that case, as you're approaching their village, all you would see are, are, these, uh, are these cores kind of surrounded. Uh, maybe they're surrounded more like a, a nebulous mist. And when they need to interact with something... Uh, you know, they, they kind of form like a, a little, like a pseudopod and they get their wood chopping axe out. And then, you know, when it's, when the tool's not needed, there you go. But when an elf approaches, the reflection comes back and the core, I don't know, the, the core could be fixed or random or something. Uh, but... And so the core could be an eye. It could be in the mouth. It could be in the chest. And they, they do look like a reflection of the, the, the... That's an awesome idea, actually, Jarnix. But that's also why the core is so important. It always shines light. And so in that regard, this is, a, this is an identifier. And there's probably no real bot... Like, in a culture... Think of this culturally... Um, and, and not to be crass, uh, you know, cultures value things or, or consider things uh, either acceptable or taboo or somewhere in between uh, because of a function or a presentation. Uh, many of our societies choose clothing because it offers protection and it also offers a, a level of hygiene. That doesn't mean that nudists are somehow inherently evil. Or that they're bad, or they're you know they're they're taking their natural forms and and they're the ones who are uh, hypersexualizing it, because they're actually desexualizing the human form. Um, you know w whether or not you're a nudist, it doesn't ruffle my feathers if you're happy not hurting anyone. Um, you know you go to I think there's some cities like I think San Francisco, uh, you can walk around uh, as long as you follow the skid mark law, and that's you got to put a hanky down if you're going to sit down on a public bench, uh, just that's more of a hygiene thing than it's a rejection of humanity issue. Yeah. Hey, Jarnix, uh, this is a, uh, this is a workshop. We're all in this together. Um, your all's ideas are going into something that is just, it's really cool. Uh, Tesla says getting into a little of how it had worked. Maybe the core shines that light uh, shines light that draws the mist into a shape. And yes, yeah, so it, it, it all goes to the core. In fact, this is even how we can explain. Uh, we can explain. So if there's like a misty body, right? And it, it is corporeal. It can interact. Uh, but if we take a, you know, it, if we take a, a weapon and we shoot one because it's going to attack us and an arrow, poo, like grazes, uh, grazes the cheek. Well, if there's this intrinsic tie that the core has, you know, to hold the form together. We have almost like a, a Metroid, um, like a, a Metroid uh, sort of thing here, right? And we kind of have like ones that go into the back and the front and, and whatnot. So if you injure this, you are injuring the light. You're injuring the core. And so that's why it still has hit points and why it doesn't phase through stuff, why it can be ultimately extinguished. 
And should they choose to put their light out, that is also why they can die. Because it's suppressing their light. It's It makes them uh, discorporate. And uh, this, if we're talking about like an icy comet, or you said uh, Tesla, what if it was like some sort of like an oxygen comet or something that struck? Uh, we have some sort of like a gaseous body, um, whether it's like a noble gas or something along those lines. It could be something that is very, uh, you know, caustic or mutagenic like oxygen, um, just in a different form. Um, hey, Zuller Pie, welcome. Uh, so we, we have these awesome gameplay mechanics going back and forth. Uh, to these people that are represented, yes, by hard mechanics as written in the write-up. But now when we're talking about giving it form, uh, in, in what do these people do and celebrate? And especially, um, well, it could be a racial fire weakness, but remember, a fire needs three things. Oxygen is clearly one of them. And, well, a, a source of the flame, you know, heat, is another uh, but there is one more aspect that requires uh, a fire to occur. And if these people don't wear stuff like clothing or fuel uh, to, uh, you know, with, uh, with the oxygen, then there won't be a fire necessarily. But so too, I'm starting to, to go back up here. We'll, we'll bring these little thingies, uh, these little thingies back here. But in order to make this kind of, uh, this very uh, interesting sort of a, a gas, a gaseous body around their light, they probably do need to consume mass because they still have mass. Uh, and so if they come by and, uh, and, you know, they eat a fish, you know, whether it's here or... The elf is just, you know, the elf wants to use its mouth to speak because biologically that's how the thing observing it looks. Uh, it could just stick the fish in its ear and the fish is drawn through the body to the core where this light, uh, this light might uh, somehow break it down or it acts like a fire, like this internal, like a soul fire. And so, as it sticks fish in its ear to eat, or it's like, oh yeah, here I'm gonna stick, uh, I'm gonna stick some broccoli in my ear. You know, it's drawn to the core. So they do need to eat. They do need water because it is a fog. It's a mist, and so water is, uh, you know, water just sort of like bubbles and flows throughout the form and and such. And so it we're, it has the same needs as many other races. So mechanically or as a DM, we don't have to say, oh, all right, so it, it's an exception to these rules and someone's playing a Warforged and somehow I have an undead. Uh, we're playing over in D&D &D time. Um, and, and actually, wait, did the, did the undead in D&D &D time trust a flum for you out there? Uh, if so, did the undead in D&D &D time have the undead traits where they don't have to breathe or eat or drink or anything? Do they not suffer exhaustion? Yeah, light is an expenditure of energy. And so we, we have this, you know, or, uh, I mean, you could have humorous, uh, you could have something humorous where you have a, a big burly orc, you know, walk up and, uh, and as, as the, as the orc, uh, other is talking to this whisper, um, you know. It is where it is. I think you're right, Maddie, because I was playing around with the idea of an undead paladin for D and D time. Okay. Now we're going through a really good mental exercise. We're developing a people. Uh, we, we're we're going back also more into the religion of wanting to be one with this star. We're even empowering the villain. I mean, because our villain's going to act the same way also. And so how does this villain look? Are there social outliers that perhaps don't just react to outside observers? Um, but what if, you know, what if there are social outliers? It could be a taboo in this, in this culture where you choose a form and you wear a form. 
And maybe that form, is, you know, by choosing a form is somehow offensive to these people. It's against the religion. It's against who they are. Aw, uh, oh, sheeps. With the, uh, with the 38, uh, with the 38 bits, uh, that is going to, uh, that will get me a, a bag of peanuts on the plane. Thank you so much. And Jarnix, thank you for the follow also. Nightwolf is almost dethroned as a stream boss. A couple other uh, donations like that or uh, or follows, and we're going to have a new stream boss. Imagine an intimidation roll you can make when you grab a whole side leg of lamb and just uh, absorb it in front of someone. Yeah, you just, you know, you just kind of, you, you plop it in there and it just, it takes a while to digest still. Um, but it just, it can sit there. Because to these people, it's normal. They're like, yeah, you're eating. I, I, I get it. But it would create a huge culture shock. Uh oh, Falen is the new stream boss. Purple, 100 bonus 10. And thank you for the bleeding purple support with that extra bonus. So now we come to the point of. If you remember Maslow's hierarchy that we showed before, we determined how they eat. We determined how they drink. They still need shelter, and they remember who they were as as uh, nomads before. So they they still, uh, you know, they still build shelters. You know, they could be oversaturated with water. They're not immune to that. Fallon says, "Come at me, bros." <laughs> Their, sh <laughs> their shelter is a lantern. I mean, maybe they that's what they call their houses. You know, it, it, as the old uh, the old nomads uh, probably had uh, lanterns, and that's that could very well be something that is is uh, is now a part of their culture and is bled into their architecture. You see how all this stuff is connected? Don't forget the weather. The weather can play a part in the architecture, and the building materials that are available can play into it as well. Hey, TJ, I'm pretty hyped right now. My IRL party just contacted me and gave me the heads up that we were playing in 20 minutes. Oof. Well, I hope you can make it, TJ. Go. What are you doing hanging around here with a bunch of nerds? Go hang out with a bunch of nerds. So let me bring this. Let me bring this back up here. So we have the hierarchy, right? And we we got to start from the uh, we got to start from the ground up. You're hanging out with nerds until I get the call uh, to go uh, to go. Yep. All right. Well then, TJ, you're welcome to stay here. So we took care of food. We took care of water. They do need to sleep. They do need to breathe. They still communicate. I mean, they they might even have their own custom language. Uh, whether it's a, I think we gave it like an old language, like it's an it's an old variant. Um, to read their moods, uh, you know, uh, so their body language might actually be something like the flicker of their their light, right? The core of their light could accent their words or show their feelings while they're while they're manipulating their mist in order to uh, in order to make words to reply back to each other. So they do need to breathe. We took care of their food. We took care of their water. They do need to sleep. Now, a couple other things that can be related um, is a sense of homeostasis. You know, how do they regulate um, and excretion? Uh, well, their excretion is probably, you know, if they turn if they turn mass into light, uh, that light could very well be. The equivalent of their pee and poo, maybe? I don't know. Or does something happen in the body where, it, you know, kind of whatever isn't consumed by the light or is excess, it does fall away somehow? Um, you know, depending on your all's, uh, depending on your all's comfort levels, we don't have to get into the nitty gritty of that. But it is something to think about. What do they do with what goes in and wh what happens, what comes back out, if anything? 
Yeah, what if they actually, you know, so they, they, they eat a lamb chop through their head and they sweat out, uh, they sweat out the remnants of the lamb chop. You know, it just kind of comes out in little, you know, little globulates or something. I assume the racial language involves the flickering, brightening, and dimming of their light. That could very well be Fallon. Um, or, I mean, I think they, they have a holdover what we were talking about, but uh, they could accent it very much. Uh, or they might have they might have developed somewhere along the line a way of incorporating. You know, if you look at uh, if you look at some tribes in uh, in Africa, uh, there are uh, there are certain languages, and probably not just there, but I think that's the most popular concept, where some inhaled uh, where some inhaled uh, you know sounds or uh, why am I uh, syllables sounds or syllables. Or they make uh, clicks or whistles instead of just what we might consider to be normal talking. And so they could accent their words with visual clicks and whistles, such as flashing patterns or, uh, th or you know, brightening or dimming. Um, and you know what? A lot of what we're talking about, we started with a reference over to Tomb of Annihilation, and you'll find that there is even a paragraph about that for the Omuan language. Uh, thinking along the lines of waste products as a luminescent liquid reactive with UV light. Okay, so they, they actually sort of, they do have an excretion of some kind. Um, and it does have this inherent, uh, it, it almost glows. So they, they kind of have like a glowy, a glowy sweat or like a, a glowy poo. Maybe they can excrete many black holes. These disappear fairly quickly and are clean, pure energy. So their entire society is based off of waste because that's energy production. <laughs> uh, instinctually, they try to avoid conflict by taking the form of whatever they appear before. Well, and you know what? We said that there was a civil war between them, and that must have been very violent. Falen, have an awesome night. Thank you for participating in the conversation again. There is one other thing then to think about. I mean, if they have something, you know, if they can be diseased or poisoned, uh, because there could be things, you know, parasites, there could be uh, germs in the water that could somehow infect, you know, or if they don't, if they don't succumb to normal germs, uh, if they have this kind of a misty, foggy body, what if they, what if they get an infection like algae or mold? And so they can get sick also. But they, they suffer from different illnesses. You know, a cold to them isn't necessarily a virus. A cold to them could be a blue-green algae that has taken up residence in its body. Think a bit like the UV spots in watches. The more light it absorbs, the brighter and longer it glows for. Uh, or instinctually, they appear the same as those appear before them, lead them astray, and make them complacent. Well, we are we are talking that there's a will-o'-wisp inspiration to that uh, bubonic. Uh, Jarnix, you're talking about the Red Sea. Oh, uh, because of uh, in in algal bloom, like uh, like red tide in Florida. You know, here in Ohio, and uh, there's a lot of uh, in, in Lake Erie. There's been a lot of talk about uh, limiting uh, phosphorus in fertilizers because we've been getting some pretty big algal blooms in Lake Erie. Rainy season, instead of head colds, they get mist mold. And, and by the way, we talked about mosquitoes. There could be something that has adapted to them, right? Mosquitoes need blood, but blood had to exist before a mosquito did. Otherwise, what was it drinking? Um... And so uh, more of the wildlife, especially the mutants in that canyon, uh, may have adapted to hunt them and favor them to eat. Uh, you know, so you have these things that can eat light or eat this uh, this sort of misty ectoplasm that is their body. Moths are their mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that suck? You know, a moth kind of flaps at you and it's like a, it's like a TT fly that lays eggs in you or something. Instead of head lice, they get mosquitoes breeding on them. Hey, all of this is a part of society. You know, uh, ticks, mosquitoes, spiders, just other things that can, 
you know, even things that can scare you. You know, what would these people be scared of? Would they be scared of a spider uh, on them? Uh, would fish make them nervous somehow? Uh, because, you know, what, what happens, uh, you know, they have to absorb the things to eat them. Uh, but maybe there's some things that aren't really absorbed or, or succumb to their light. Uh, that have developed some sort of reflective scales, so they can't be digested, so they're more parasitic, or they're just hard to digest. I mean, oh, sheeps, let's draw on reality. Some people have digestive issues, uh, whether it's intestinal or it's an allergy or something along those lines. Who's to say that things don't exist? There's uh, maybe, you know, we can eat anchovies, but maybe because anchovies are covered in this uh, reflective silver scale, uh, these creatures can't eat fish like that. At least not without preparing them specially. Yeah, modified sturge. Exactly, bubonic one. Now I'm thinking of a culture of using spider webs as markings like tattoos. Age of Tesla. Isn't this an amazing process? They're the creature form of having your mouth open on a bike ride, just constantly eating bugs on accident. That could very well be also, oh sheeps. They might not have necessarily a lot of farms or ranches. Uh, they might be able to live off of the land in a lot of different ways. Shout out to digestion. It's a lot to swallow, but it'll all pass eventually. Orcs make beautiful lovers. Welcome. It's great to see you here. Is it possible that sound waves of certain frequencies damage them if loud enough so their enemies could use sonic disruptors? Um, I don't see why not. Now, I don't know if that is uh, that would bleed over to a... I don't know if that would bleed over to a mechanic, you know, like a, a racial mechanic per se. Uh, but that could be something as a DM if we're going to introduce this race that, you know, th they probably don't communicate too loudly. They could be they could be sensitive to sound in some way. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, sheeps. Cricket flowers becoming very popular. Um, uh, you can you can find like chocolate covered ants, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, they may not need to rely on agriculture, so they still have to eat. But think about that. What does that do to their economy? What does that do to their society? And there's probably things that they can digest easier than others. You know, we're not talking about the blob or like a, a gelatinous cube that just eats anything that's organic. They might not be able to do that. It has to, you know, it might still, uh, it might still have to be some sort of a, you know, easily digestive you know, carbohydrate or protein or something. What if they did do agriculture as a way to get the food potato bug? Oh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's like uh, growing corn on your farm, to, but you're doing that to feed your cattle, and then you eat your cattle. Not necessarily the corn. Mordecai was originally a pescatarian because he had digestive issues with red meats. Hey, well, yeah, I remember you saying that. Uh, that, you know, uh, that's something else to think about, too. I, I said it in the prior segment. You know, how many of you have ever played a character that's had allergies or ever caught a common cold? How many of you have played a character who is a vegetarian, or in this case, a pescatarian? Um, and not out of a, necessarily a conscientious objection, but because you said, you know what? My character has IBS or, or you know, Crohn's or something, right? You know, you have, you have a, a bit of a, a delicate uh, intestinal constitution. Not mechanically with your score, perhaps, but you just choose to have that be a lifestyle. Oh, gotcha, oh sheeps. You do play orcs. Uh, orcs probably also make wonderful chefs. Is, is that your alt account on Twitch, if you ever need one, orcs? In video games, Sekiro eats rice raw. I've played a character who is a carnivore. Oh, yeah, weasels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, there's one more thing that we that we should talk about in order to f uh, to build this uh, this foundation of the Society of Whispers here. That sounds very ominous, but... Off-topic question. How would one adopt a mini? No mini should be without a home. Uh... 
Coffee Cat, can you help uh, Jarnix uh, describe the process of getting a box or singles and, and what happens on Discord, please? So, it's this issue right here. How, how do these people reproduce? There's, there's a couple things we can draw from uh, IRL, if we so choose. We can have this be that, uh, you know, we have a mommy and a daddy. You know, is, is there actually, that actually we need to take one step further. Are there, are there two different sexes among these people? Or have they just formed, they're all the same in some fashion. You know, they, they might have unique experiences and personalities. Um, but is it necessarily not necess uh, not a uh, uh, a mother and father figure uh, who then you know make a little babby a little babby light, or do we have a, a mitosis where one light splits into two, or have they lost some uniqueness in that sense, and we have a meiosis? And in a meiosis, you have one cell. Uh, it's uh, no, hang on. Uh, my mitosis is the division. Meiosis is um. Oh, uh, this is uh, two different cells. So we have cell A and cell B. I'm trying to think back to my uh, to my biology classes here. So this is mitosis, with a T. Um, meiosis is one spell one cell splits into two similar like two copies if I am remembering correctly uh, yeah do, do they bud are they asexual that could very well be and yes Zulerpi you're one step ahead of me you're one step ahead of me but that is a very good thing to bring up Maybe they find material for a new core and a bunch of wisps radiate into it. Yeah, so uh, so it's sort of like fish spawning. You know, how... Uh, it, well, in a, in a way, you know, the female fish lays the eggs. The male fish just kind of passes over and uh, and sort of inseminates the water. And, uh, and then, you know, that falls down on the eggs and fertilizes them. So it's an external fertilization in that case. So if we look at nature, there's a lot of things to consider. Uh, does it require... You know, it, it, can it be uh, a split internally? Is it asexual? Uh, is it, uh, is it, uh, does it require two sexes? And if so, is it an internal fertilization or an external one? Or, as Zulerpai said, and there's actually a, at least one, there's one Star Trek episode that, uh, uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, I believe, that deals with a race of aliens that actually has three sexes. You have sort of the male and female that are dominant, but then there's this third sex that is required for reproduction, but is almost considered uh, like an androgynous, like a, a slave race. You know, like every every pair has one of these in order to make babies, but that's pretty much all they're used for. Um, and you could end up having that. Like, you might have... Uh, we could end up with a society where you have a... You have a carrier core. So you could be uh, born or created as a carrier. Uh, and so then you have a... You have a male and a female. And so the carrier might actually need to... Uh, to have genetic material from the male and female each implanted into it and then this is the this is the one then that births a new core that could be interesting think of the society that 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 creates as well in this society this could be a slave race this could actually be the the master right so the males and females you know, they live on their own, but they venerate these, uh, the carriers. 
or the, the gestators or whatever you want to call it. And so maybe not a lot of these exist. Um, and so uh, the, the male and female majorities would go to them almost like uh, going to a celebrant of some kind, be it a, well, in our culture, a judge or a religious um, or, or to a religious person who performs a marriage. And, but instead of a, a marriage, perhaps religiously, or we could include religion, uh, couples would go to their town's carrier and uh, produce the, the genetic material, such as it exists, and the carrier would then um, would make the babies for the, for the town. So a town might have like two or three carriers because they could be rare. And there could be a waiting list, who knows? There's all sorts of fun stuff that we can do here. While still, you know, you know, like I don't mind talking biology. You know, biology's not really R-rated because we're approaching things scientifically. You know, so we can say things like things that would make us snicker in sex ed class, like sperm or eggs. Tee <laughs> fallopian tubes. Because we're we're speaking of the science. We're speaking of how do these people meet this foundational need to reproduce in their society? And then how does the culture build on that? Does it create gender roles? Does it create, uh, does it support uh, various cultural habits or taboos? Does it influence their religion or lack of religion? Uh, sorry, I fell a little bit behind in chat here. So Osheep says uh, budding. Uh, asexual, like Bubonic said. Why not three sexes, says Zuller Pie. Victor says hello, and hello, Victor. Uh, Age of Tesla, maybe they find material for a new core and a bunch of wisps radiate into it. Uh, what about a four sex system like A, B, A, B, and O blood types? Ooh, pardon. A plus B plus O equals O splits into two, either A or B or A, B, and O. Th hey, if these were flesh and blood people at one point in time, age of Tesla, nomads who moved into this region because they were following this falling star, they have blood and they may not realize. I mean, look, how long did it take human beings to realize that not all blood is compatible? That, that could be a case. What if they're reproductive? Or what if they're what if their sex or their gender? I I know, especially in today's twenty nineteen, we are finding they're not. You know, d different people are going to say different things about it. I, I don't want to get into a sticky wicket or whatever, but uh, you know, we're we grew up in our way because we understood you know a very biological insert tab A into slot B. But what if these people who are were irradiated by this magic or radiation, you know, a part of them that flowed through them, their blood, that could that could end up being um, a compatibility issue, right? That could also kind of go into that uh, into the, the superstition that the Japanese have about different personality types. Cogenitor, uh, thank you, Bubonic. Episode 48, oh, you are such a lovely nerd, Bubonic. Thank you very much for that. When a mommy and daddy love each other very much, they go to the town surrogate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, sheeps. The teacher told us not to laugh, so I'm not going to laugh at that word. <laughs> Look at the amazing ideas that's sitting down and just thinking about this. Having a all everything that we've talked about are are uh our meteorology our geology our geography our oceanography our biology a lot of this is 101 level stuff like this is high school level stuff that we're talking about this is sex ed this is just cracking open a high school book on rocks and yet look at the depth that we're that we're creating to make a unique race and culture that's not just uh, orcs, but they have uh, four ears. And so they get orc stuff, but they also get the perception skill. Yes. I've always, <laughs> I've been meaning to find a way to play a character that automatically gets perception that's not an elf. You know, 
uh, we're, we're coming up with something from the ground up, and it's amazing. All of this, all the things that we're doing here. Uh, Zulerpai, I'm just reading IKEA instructions. I don't know what you're thinking. IKEA furniture is extremely family friendly. Song Byung-gu wins ASL and that spawns a new wisp. I, I don't get the reference, unfortunately, Tesla. Um, is that what we're calling it nowadays? Make an Ikea? <laughs> you want to build some furniture? The pro brood war player Stork. Could it be like the goblins and goblin slayer reproducing? Oh yeah, uh, Tenu. Uh, that that's something else too. Uh, this this race, you know, as much as we talked about it having mosquitoes and things feeding on them. Um, yeah, babe, it's not what you think. I was just building furniture with her. <laughs> Uh, the Matty Morgue's way of fading to black is building Ikea. <laughs> I should just, I should find like an instruction manual for some furniture or something. And anytime it's needed, I'll just like slowly hold it up in front of the camera. And <laughs> Get some sound effects. Another streamer I watch uh, used to call it touching butts. <laughs> that that that's a very uh, you know it's a very fluffy way of uh, you know light and delightful and and uh, summery full of uh, fun uh, way of putting it. Uh, so yeah, Tenu, that could be something else as well. Uh, what if uh, so? What if the lights themselves aren't necessarily uh, aren't necessarily uh, reproducing themselves? Uh, but what if, in a world where light has to reproduce itself, you know, what if we have a, uh, we have a moo cow? So what if they actually raise animals, um, and somehow, uh, you know, material from this thing is put into an animal, and it, it gestates inside another creature... And a little babby uh, light sphere is born. You know, we don't have to... It, we could talk like alien style. Uh, we could talk more like it de It somehow develops naturally. Uh, so in kind of a quasi... Um, you know, in, in a quasi... Um, immaculate conception kind of way. Where a biological being uh, has a supernatural entity... Uh, not necessarily physically harm it in reproducing and a you know a biological baby is formed from it uh, but you know maybe it then kind of hatch it, it hatches out or something and uh, and the cycle then continues On a sound wave idea, maybe three are needed to make good harmony to give birth by singing a trio. So it, it's more about forming some kind of a harmony. How would that interact with the light then, Zuler Pi? If we have these light cores. Right, because we're, we're taking care of a fundamental, uh, we're taking care of a, a fundamental need about reproduction. Pardon. And again, once we have this bedrock here, 
every we can build the rest of this very easily. Pardon, but we gotta figure out this stuff, especially if we're gonna be weird about it. And not just say food goes in mouth, waste comes out other end, and uh you know babies are made uh in a a traditional fashion amongst uh all the races. They reproduce through a barbershop quartet. Well, I mean, in that case, you just get that hello, 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 and the baby pops out. Hello. <laughs> the baby's the four, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hello my baby hello my honey hello my ragtime gal send me a kiss by wire baby my heart's on fire the light cores would vibrate in sync like laser like laser tweezers remove small objects a small new being is created from parts of each of the three cores so what they would probably do then is before reproduction is to take place uh there are there's probably going to be then a social bond shared you know so th this could very well be a um a polyamorous society um where you know it it, it could uh it, it could need the necessitation of many others in order to produce the one uh, and so, you know, the three would decide, all right, we're going to get together and do this. So if there's only two, you can, you know, you can fool around and there's no worries. Um, and then they they send out, uh, you know, so, so they eat and eat and, and their cores get like really big. And then at that point, the three of them, uh, instead of touching butts, they touch cores and they kind of do like a, a little shimmy vibrate. And a part of each of the cores then f uh, form a little babby core. And then, uh, and so then they reduce in size. And then the little babby core has to be fed food in order for it to grow. Monogamous is hard enough, says those sheeps. Well, they may... I mean, does it have to be a, like a loving uh, relationship in some sort of religious wedlock? It could. Uh, or they could just realize we want to... You know, I haven't been with you yet. And so, and so they are willing to share themselves with others as a way to form social bonds. Um, I, I think a go-to for a lot of people about a society like that are the... Uh, the Bonobos. The Bonobo monkeys? Am I correct on that? Uh, Fallon says, eight gendered beings, when the season is right, anyone who wants is welcome to pour some of themselves into some place. Maybe kind of like a plant or a pod. And yeah, and the prior example doesn't have to be an animal necessarily. Uh, so, the gnome almost got eaten by a mind flayer tonight. Chain Devil almost had its way with the bard. And the guest, I mean, that sounds like it, what bards want. Um, and the guest dwarf's skull is too thick for a mind flayer's beak to bite through. <laughs> All this and more on the next episode of Derek. Derek. Derek Dungeons and Dr It's not like Dragon Ball Z. Uh, you get what I'm saying. <laughs> I tried. Well, uh, so the, the number in this case could be arbitrary. Uh, if we really want to institute it as a resonance, if we want to have... Because uh, even in this setup, we can still go, you know, male, female, and then this this kind of neutral or this, you know, of this, uh, this surrogate, uh, this surrogate gender, um, you know, or we can call it like a resonator gender. Because you know what? In this pairing, uh, this is the resonator, but in the next one... 
uh, this same one uh, then takes the position of the male in the resonance to reproduce. It, there's a lot that we can do. I mean, we could say it takes a hundred of them to all, you know, to all offer something. Um, so I, I, I don't want to sound dismissive. We can take this in a ton of different directions. We really, really can. It was a night, but Derek, did you have fun? <laughs> That's the question. Did you have fun, Derek? Mort yeah, Mordecai hasn't really been a spicy boy. Because uh, look, in the in the Tuesday game, if everyone, in the, if, if like myself and everyone in chat was like, <gasps> at the fact that you, you ran out and gave sort of like a, a quasi-innocent kiss uh, to Bright, uh, that definitely doesn't make you a floozy. Uh, I must have missed the memo because my barbarian was the one seducing everyone. <laughs> you. Now. <laughs> oh, please. You're alright, just trying to figure out how to challenge them in more interesting ways. If you ever need ideas, Derek, this is the place to come. You're starting to crash. Hey, Jarnix. Thank you for finding us. Thank you for taking uh, the time and the opportunity to click on the link and to, to see who we are. Who's this weirdo with a MS Paint and a spreadsheet open and a D&D &D corner of Twitch? I hope you enjoyed your stay here, and I appreciate your contributions to our, our project. Uh, she was a tiny tiefling that was way too hyper, but apparently it was charming to a lot of them. Ah, gotcha. Ooh, you got to watch out for those short stacks. They seduce like no one's business. So there's a War of the Wisps. Uh, could that be about reproduction? Uh, the powers of two versus the prime number groupings? Um, uh, possibly Zuler Pie. We didn't really get into it. Besides the fact that when the nomads first arrived, uh, part of the nomads uh, were lost in the swamps and the others continued on. And then each developed in their own biome. After a time, they ended up uh, seeing each other and there must have been something that broke down. You know, contact was made, something happened along the way, and then the two went to war. And when we pick up in the story, in the development of this sandbox, re uh, this sandbox region of a campaign setting that we've been working on this week, the Civil War had been resolved not that long ago. I mean, a month? Ten years? Ten years isn't that long. Um, but X amount of time has passed, and we're now in a tentative era of peace. And so, yeah, we could have this be like the star-bellied Sneetches. You know, you want to go Susian with this? We'll go Susian with this. She was full of, full of fire. Uh, religious war. Uh, yes, that that could play into what we've developed, as the forest people have become, um, have become godless, and so they're knowledgeable about religion, but they don't venerate it like a faith. They study it like a science. Um, they, they do believe, in fact, they live like on, in, and over this fallen star, this, this comet, but they don't treat it like a, a cosmic being. Uh, they treat it like something that deserves respect and study, but they don't treat it the same way that those who grew up in the swamp treat the falling star. And so it could have been a war of differences of opinion. You know, why don't you worship the star? Because the star's not worth worship. What do you mean? What do you mean? Well, it fell. We followed it. This is our history. This is known, Khaleesi. Yeah, but it's also just a rock. It has mysterious powers that we're studying, but it's just a rock. What? That's egregious. How did you know a word with that many syllables? Oh, them's fighting words. Ah, that's more like the, the backwater swamp folk we know. And, and then it builds.
Some y'all mightn't say she's full of vinegar too. Quite feisty. Kept busier than two cats covering up. Oh, sheeps, do I, do I get to re, uh, retain my southern pedigree at all? By the power vested in you, uh, and perhaps others uh, from a more southern demographic, uh, while I, I may have lived more time in Ohio than in the south, do I get to retain uh, a claim, a stake of claim? I, I reckon why not. <laughs> Tort harm and nothing. You know, we appreciate a Yankee more than a damn Yankee because you know what the difference is. <laughs> I can. I can. Oh, goodness. Well, I don't know if we decided on a way that these things reproduce, but we explored so many different ways. And from here, it's really just a matter of building the society up. And you know what all of this stuff can be boiled into? the racial entry you know go back real quick uh class open up your uh your player's handbooks and uh and let's look at something like halflings all right nice quote talks about their if you in fact if we go back to the worksheet where we have these placeholders you know talks about uh physicality uh talks about um Ooh, pardon me. Talks about their uh, their physicality. Talks about their society, their culture. Um, it it talks about their you know their diet. It talks about their lifestyle. It talks about um, things that might be considered uh, good or bad to them. I do declare. Hey, Terror. Good to see you again. Welcome back. <laughs> Forgot my book at home. Can I share? Can I share with the... Yeah, you can share your book, oh sheeps. <laughs> Oop, not that. We're going kind of... We're going kind of hazy with it. So there you go, everyone. We did it. If only by planting the seeds, and this is an excellent season to do so. I don't know if any of you garden, but make sure. Uh, I think we're past our... I think a lot of us, uh, even in the north here, are past our final frost point. Uh, so if you're going to get your gardens going, get them going soon. Um... Up late again? Well, welcome, Terror. You can hang out with us as much as you'd like. Uh, yeah, Sheeps. Uh, all of this stuff is going to be provided on the Discord. And, uh, I'll show you where. Boop. Okay. So, if you see here at the top, where it says Stream Content, at the end of a broadcast week, I upload all of our segments. Uh, I upload all of our segments to YouTube. And then I post those segments. You know, I'll start a new section, right? That has the date. And if there's information, I'll, pro I'll provide it. And then I will put a link to the video so you can watch it be made. However, any documents we produce, with some exception, any documents we produce, such as Zula, this level one druid, I put here so you can download it. Do you like uh, Garenyar? 
you can download Garen Yar. You know, do you like Delilah Weatherfair? Then you can download Delilah Weatherfair. Let's go back even further. Do you like our, our uh, not Ravnica, our Eberron storytelling that we did this week? And you're like, oh man, that, that uh, how do we go about making this character map? Download the character map and see for yourself. Use this as a as a base, especially if you just want to if you want to download, um, if you want to download the characters, right? Because the 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 characters and all that were were talked about, um, and gone over with the these other videos. So it's all right here for you. And, but wait, there's more. You can see what we did last year. If you come down here to old workshops and you click on old workshops and lo and behold, here's the stuff that we did last year. Also, you want to, you want to learn how to use the snowflake method to do storytelling? Why here's the devil's do a water deep story that we created using that technique. And here's the uh, open, uh, the open office, our, our word documents that we created for that. It's all right here. Hey, there's a Derek. You don't have to be a subscriber. Heck, you don't even have to be a follower. As long as you're on the Discord, uh, you can access this because, look, I may, I may spawn a lot of ideas here and I may be the medium of them, but these are our ideas. You know, th these are the things that we think about. And if nothing else, let's say that that you you weren't around for that broadcast and you didn't participate in it. I want you to have these ideas so you can think about them and be a better artist, be a better storyteller. You like most of something that we did, but you you think of a way that you want to personalize it. Download it and use it. I don't have a tracker of like, well, who's downloading my stuff and who's using it and how are they modifying it? <sighs> no. All I care about is you're out there being an awesome person using your imagination and having fun playing games with others or storytelling. And if this helps you do it, have at it. Just play nicely. <laughs> uh, I fell behind in chat again. Uh, Jack says, this is really awkward to ask, but is there a reason I can't subscribe using my Prime? Uh, I, there's no setting on my end that somehow rejects it, because, uh, people even recently have used Prime to subscribe to the, the channel. So, maybe, is it still held up with another, uh, is it still, like, in use with another streamer? Uh, maybe that could be it, Jack? Oh, coffee, you're on it. You, you said what I was getting to. Uh, Tamarick, welcome and thank you for the follow. I hope you've been enjoying the conversation. Not gonna lie, I forgot to use it for two months, but I look at any other person's channel and it lets me. That's weird. I I wish I could tell you, Jack. There might be some sort of a settings or if... Uh, it, at, oh, do this. Uh, if you go to your subscriptions list, maybe that will tell you where your Prime is being used? Question mark? All right, oh sheeps, do what you gotta do. Hey, Shukan, welcome. You are here. And you say there is more, cause I am here. Uh, that was a, a cool looking flow chart or map. What was that? Uh, that was a character map that we made for four characters in order to, as DMs, look at plot hooks, relationships. I, I can bring it back up here in a second. If, um, actually, Derek, if you're still around, you might be able to give a, a lot more insight into a character map. Uh, the, the snowflake method, uh, you can find that online, but if you want to see it demonstrated, you can find that on our, on our Discord, Tamarick. I'm upset. I sent a ticket in. Hopefully this gets resolved. Just realized it's not showing on any channel. Oh, goodness, Jack. Yeah, uh, hopefully they can get back to you about it, and it's not some... I don't know, weird typographical or billing issue. Um, now, if you want a more immediate link for the, the snowflake telling method, Tamarick, 
if you go to the channel on our Discord that is art and writing under our mentor network, I provided those videos to Black Wolf, who is, uh, who is considering using that writing method. And so it's more immediately right there instead of having to go back into September of last year's records. Uh, Hark, I downloaded a character because I like the sheets layout and printed a blank version out to use and to make copies of myself. That's absolutely fine too. Hark, if you're using the materials that are here and you're having fun, uh, we all win. Success isn't a, a zero-sum game. Hey, Trust of Flump has also arrived. So uh, we are even greater now for having Shukan and Trust of Flump arriving. So Trust of Flump, I don't know if you were around for it, but uh, we, we created, I don't know if it's like a Matty Morgs race or it's just a, a concept, but uh, if you're around for any of it, I hope you like the idea that we're, we're putting in place. No, but devouring brains is a zero-sum game. Well, yes, because you will eventually run out of brains. That's why zombies have to get a human breeding program going, so you don't run out of brains. You're Oh, yeah, uh, that's right. You have a game on Saturdays, Trust of Flump. Are zombies smart enough for that? It depends on the zombie. There's quick zombies... There's slow zombies, and there's smart zombies, and there's there's dumbos. Ignit zombies, what we call them, on the homestead. Can you see the character map again? Oh, yeah, that's right, Derek. You got to... Oh, it was your first Mind Flayer you got to run. Yeah, how... Uh, can, you, can you get into detail about that? All right, so if you want to, if you want to see the character map being made, wait for it. Punkt M3. Oh snap! Bleed purple seven hundred and sixty bonus seventy six. Thank you. There's that. And there is also... That was setting it up, and then the, the completion of it is here. And this was the character map that we ended up... I mean, it was a lot bigger because we wanted to make a lot of room here. So we generated four characters, and starting with Francis one at a time we went through aspects that make the character the character we we looped them to each other then we made uh mula same process and then we were able to make some links between them and then we made ulf and then we made almire and by the time we were done we have a party of player characters that have their own things going on and they're interconnected so as something in the character web moves or jostles, it can tug at other aspects of the characters. So everyone is invested in the content you're running as a dungeon master is relevant to everyone in some way. Uh, hey, thank Macab Derek. Uh, he was my co-pilot. And by that I mean I was his co-pilot as he was guiding me through this. Derek, take the wheel. Uh, and trust a flump. Yeah, so we had a total of... Uh, Six plus seven, so 13. 
but if we round up with the bonus, it's 14. So, how do you want to break that down, Trust of Flump? Oh, wait, no, because 13... It's 1322. I, I was thinking of Dungeon of the Mad Mage. I'm sorry. Because that's also the big boxes. Um, Alright, so, uh, MM3 is 13, and you, you have achieved that. Uh, what do you want to do with the extra bits, then, that you have? Use the info to run uh, Waterdeep in detail. Oh, you started Dragon Heist, but they bailed on it? Huh. There's those zombie skeletons with spikes that held souls of dead people, uh, then could use them for ability. I found that a cool concept. As, uh, is that in regards to Mind Flayer's Terror, or is this a different type of monster? I mean, yeah, same deal. That campaign was meant to be looted to heck. Yeah, trust a flump. I, I, I mean, it's, it's really... It's really a water deep primer that has an adventure inside of it. it almost, a, it, it's kind of the opposite of Ravnica. Ravnica is a source book that has an adventure. This is an adventure that has a source book. That's so awesome. I'd like to do that, but I never thought of drawing it in a diagram. Uh, yeah, uh, Tamarick, and if I'm mispronouncing that, please correct me. Um, this is an excellent way as a dungeon master to lay out your party and to understand their relationships, find commonalities, and to address aspects of a story that are going to engage uh, many, if not all of them, directly or indirectly. Are you wanting me to hijack you again? I'm still surprised we're on speaking terms. What? No, we're of course we're on speaking terms. And uh, and I mean, yeah, uh, I can, you know, we could do something like this in another week. We didn't actually make characters this week. Uh, this was pure setting and setup and regions and map making and, and all that other stuff. Any change can go into the pool. Oh, thank you, uh, Trust. Uh, that way it's also very character-centered, which makes my players feel more engaged. Exactly. Go, go, TwitchCon. I have not... Uh, my brain doesn't comprehend this stuff very well. <laughs> All right, so if we are going to be doing this... Why don't we pop a box? 